All right, the six points of Calvinism is what I'm calling this series. And usually you will hear people talk about the five points of Calvinism. And uh, the five points of Calvinism are usually uh, referred to as an acrostic that spells tulip, uh, which is total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints. Uh, we're gonna cover those in detail, okay? What they say about it and what the Bible says about it. Okay, but there's another point that is very, very important to remember, and that is the Calvinist view of the sovereignty of God. The sovereignty of God. Um, every one of us believes that we worship a God who is all-powerful, all-knowing, uh, all-wise, um, a God who is love, a God who is justice, a God who is holy, and so on. Uh, we believe He is the sovereign, the master, the ruler of the universe, everything that's ever been made, and of course He made it all. Okay, so we believe in that God. The Calvinist has a twist on that doctrine. To them, sovereignty means God determines everything. Everything. He predetermines. In fact, God determined before the foundation of the world that on this day, Howard would wear that pig tie. Now, I don't think so. Okay? But Calvinists literally believe that. Okay? Not every Calvinist, but many of them do. Many of the great leaders, the great theologians of Calvinism would say that God decides everything. Okay, you went to your closet this morning and, and decided, well, I had to decide, was I going to wear the blue shirt or the red shirt that I brought with me? Okay, I made a choice. The Calvinist says, no, you didn't. You think you made a choice. God made that choice before He even created the universe. Okay, and I'm serious. That's what they teach. Okay, so what about your sin? Okay, I think everybody here is a sinner, right? I think we would all agree to that. Um, well, you think you chose to do something wrong. No, you didn't. God chose it for you. Okay? Now, I hear that and I go, oh, you've got to be kidding. But that's what Calvinists believe. That's what they teach. Okay? It is not a harmless difference between us and them. It is a major, major problem in many ways. And one of the worst things is what it makes God out to be, okay? Uh, which is not holy, not honest, not just, not loving, okay? Anyway, we will get to all that later. Let's talk about a little bit of history here. And <laughs> let's see, I have got four and a quarter pages of history, but I'm not going to cover it all. Okay, most of it, but not all. Okay, um, John Calvin uh, was a Frenchman, uh, Jean Chauvin or something like that, not Chauvin because that's chauvinist, uh, but a, a name similar to that. It was changed into the English version is John Calvin. Okay, John Calvin. But he was a Frenchman born in 1509. He died in Switzerland in 1564. He was a contemporary somewhat younger, but a contemporary of Martin Luther, okay? Luther in Germany, Calvin in France, and then Switzerland. Um, his father was a secretary and legal advisor to a Roman Catholic bishop. So he grew up in a staunch Roman Catholic family. Calvin himself was on the Roman Catholic Church payroll starting at 12 years of age. Okay, now I, don't, I can't imagine what he was doing unless he was snow shoveling or something. Um, but he was paid by the same bishop that, that hired his father. 
And he stayed on that payroll for 13 years, which was one year after he supposedly got saved. Okay, I would have thought, you know, you'd end it quicker than that, but he didn't. Um, he went to Paris to study theology. His father intended him for the priesthood, but then, I don't know what the dad did, but he got not only fired, but excommunicated. And so he pulled his son out of seminary and put him in a school in another city to study law. And Calvin became a lawyer. He returned to Paris uh, some years later and he got involved in Lutheranism, okay, which was, you know, the hot thing at that time. Uh, this was, oh, 16 years after Martin Luther nailed the 95 Theses on the church door in Wittenberg, Germany. Um, he was converted in 1533, converted to Lutheranism. Uh, and there's a lot of similarities. This matter of the free will of man, uh, Lutherans don't believe in it either. Okay, now let, let me say this. Um, if I say something about Lutherans, or if I say something about Calvinists, which means uh, Reformed Church, Christian Reformed Church, um, Presbyterian, uh, I was raised Presbyterian myself. Um, if I say something, don't take it as being derogatory of every person that goes to those churches, because there's some fine people in those churches. Okay, there's a lot of decent people in those churches. I was raised Presbyterian. I was lost as I could be. I never heard the gospel. Well, I can't, can't say that. I remember when I was about three years old, a Sunday school teacher teaching us John 3.16. Okay, I remembered it. When I heard it again when I was 16 and somebody explained it to me, then I got saved. But I can remember memorizing it when I was three, four years old. Okay, um, anyhow, let's move on. Calvin published a book called The Institutes of the Christian Religion. He later revised it. It ended up about five times as long as the first edition. The final edition is roughly 1,000, 1,100 pages depending on how it's printed. So the first one was a couple hundred pages long. It is regarded as by some, by Calvinists, as outside the Bible probably the most important book ever written. And it is Calvinist theology. Okay? He published that in 1535. Okay? Now his conversion was 1533. I don't know too many people who two years after they get saved are capable of writing a book on theology that is still studied today, 500, almost, you know, about 500 years later, okay, and still regarded as one of the most important books in Christendom. Okay, how could that be? He's a baby Christian. Okay, how are you two years after you got saved? Okay, two years after he gets saved, he writes this book. How could he do that? He could do that because as a Roman Catholic studying for the ministry, studying for the priesthood, he studied St. Augustine. And Calvinism is really Augustinianism, okay, which was about a thousand years before Calvin, and it's the backbone of the Roman Catholic Church. Okay, so, and we're going to see more of that. Um, he wasn't an expert on the Bible. He was an expert on St. Augustine. And that's where he got most of his, his doctrine. And it's where Luther got a whole lot of his, because Luther was a Catholic priest and also studied Augustine. Um, Calvin spent from 1541 to 1564 in Geneva, Switzerland. Okay, a little over 20 years, 23 years he was there. Um, because there were Catholics within Geneva who did not want to be Protestant, and because there were Catholic armies, okay, this is the Reformation period when Protestants were killing Catholics and Catholics were killing Protestants, 
and everybody was killing Baptists. Okay. Um, seriously, you know, that's what happened. Okay. Um, because of that situation, the city council of Geneva turned more and more power over to Calvin because he ruled the church. Okay, it was a state church. You had to be a member of his church if you were going to be a citizen of Geneva. Okay, so he gained more and more power. You have probably sometime in your life heard a pastor who was maybe somewhat authoritarian in his manner. You've probably heard a pastor called a Protestant Pope. Well, that phrase was first applied to John Calvin. Okay, and he ruled Geneva, Switzerland. Okay, um, he wasn't, you know, a slightly overbearing Baptist preacher. Okay, he, he, well, we'll talk more in just a minute. Okay, everybody had to belong to the state church. They had to attend regularly. They had to believe the church creed and live morally. Investigators were sent by the church to the homes every week. That's going to go over real good, isn't it? Okay? They come with their clipboard, I suppose, if they had clipboards back then. Did you go to church this week? Yes, I did. Did you do this this week? Yes. Did, that, did, that, did, that, did, that. did you? Oh, you did. Oh, well, that mark goes over here. Okay? I mean, that's what they did weekly. How'd you like that? You know, what'd you think of the pastor's sermon? Guess what? You had to agree with John Calvin. Okay? You didn't have a choice. You had to agree with John Calvin or you were in trouble. And if you said anything against Calvin or anything that he wrote, you were in real trouble. Okay? Um, disobedience to the consistory, which were the people leading the church, was punished by the city council. So the church would decide if you were right or wrong, and the city council would deal out the punishment. Okay? Uh, speaking against Calvin or his books was against the law. Uh, no freedom of speech. Between 1542 and 1564, there were 76 banishments in Geneva, where people, sometimes an individual, sometimes a whole class of people, like one time he drove out all the Mennonites, okay, the end of November in Switzerland, gave them two days to take care of their property, sell it or whatever, and then driven out of town. Okay? Beginning of the winter in the mountains of Switzerland. Okay, that's real nice, isn't it? Okay? And in that time frame, 22 years, <clears throat> there were 58 executions. Executions for people that did things that Calvin didn't like. Geneva, Switzerland at that time had a population of 20,000 people. Okay? 20,000 people, 50, 58 people executed. Okay? I mean, think about this. What would that be in the Quad Cities area? And Pastor Joe, didn't you say the population in the, the Quad Cities, 500,000? Okay, so take 50 and multi or 58 and multiply it by 25, and you would have the same ratio here in the Quad Cities. I mean, think about it. That's pretty awful. Most states in the United States haven't executed anybody in 20 years, or 25 years, or more. Um, there was one fellow. Is, this is just one example out of the 58. There was a fellow named Michael Servetus. Um, I believe he was Spanish. Uh, he was a known heretic. He was very, very strange. 
Uh, some people think he was mentally ill. Uh, he said a lot of outlandish stuff. Um, for some reason, he, he was going from France to Italy. He decided to go through Switzerland. So he passes through Geneva, and he wasn't very smart. He decided, I want to hear John Calvin preach. So he goes to church on Sunday morning. I don't know if you all know, but from the pulpit, you can see everything that's going on. Okay? <laughs> John Calvin recognized him, had him arrested, charged him with, let me see, 38 different charges against him. He was convicted on two of them. One of the charges was he was a Unitarian. Okay, now a Unitarian is someone who believes that there's one God, which we believe, but he's just one person. There's no three members of the Godhead. Okay, he may sometimes appear as the Father, sometimes as the Son, sometimes as the Spirit, but he can't be three at once. Okay, that's a Unitarian. That's contrary to the Word of God. The Bible records instances where all three are present at the same time, all manifested at the same time. Okay, so the Trinity is, is what the Bible says. Okay, so the man was a heretic, at least on that issue, and I think probably on others. But the second thing that he was convicted of was denying infant baptism. Now, if you're a member of the church, you're one of those too, right? We don't believe and practice infant baptism. I've read the Bible through quite a few times. I've taught the entire thing several times. I've never seen infant baptism, okay? It's not there. But this man, Michael Servetus, was burned at the stake because he believed in infant baptism. Okay? They tried to talk Calvin into being merciful and just cutting his head off. Okay? <laughs> That's Calvinist mercy. Uh, <laughs> just cutting his head off. But he wouldn't do it. He said, no, he deserves to be burned at the stake. So they burned him at the stake. Okay? And, and folks, all of this is, is verifiable, bona fide history. This isn't made up by some anti-Calvinist. Okay? It's true. It's real. Um, if John Calvin had the power in Davenport that he had in Geneva, if he was here today and had that power, we would all be in grave danger. And I can guarantee you we wouldn't be in a building with a sign out front that says Baptist. Okay, we'd probably be in somebody's basement, you know, hiding and hoping nobody finds out where we are. We'd park our cars blocks away and walk in one or two at a time and things like that, like believers used to have to do in the Soviet Union. Okay, like believers have to do in Muslim countries today. Believers had to do that in Geneva or forfeit their life. Okay? And yet this man is revered as a great expositor of the Word of God, as a great theologian, as the revealer of true Christianity to the world. And he is far, far, far from those things. Okay. Um, doctrines that Calvin got from Augustine. And this, I know I'm going very fast, and there's no other way I can do it, okay? I've got to do it fast because there's so much. Um, okay, Calvin got these things from Augustine. Augustine was a Catholic bishop. Well, we'll talk more about him in a minute, but he's a Catholic bishop who is regarded as basically the inventor 
of the Roman Catholic Church. Okay, and the, I, the Catholic Church says they go back to Peter. That's not really true. Okay, the Catholic Church where Rome was regarded as the power, the preeminent church in Western Europe, that began in the late 300s, early 400s, and Augustine gave it theological oomph. Okay, gave it a theological basis so that they could defend their position. The sovereignty of God, this is what Calvin got from Augustine, the sovereignty of God makes God the cause of all things. All things, including sin. Okay, God is the cause of everything. Nothing happens without God making it happen. Uh, Augustine came up with that. Predestination of some to salvation and others to damnation. Okay, Augustine created that doctrine, and Calvin picked it up from Augustine. Faith is, okay, this is good. Faith is the irresistible gift of God to the elect. Okay, God gives faith to the few whom He has chosen. And it's a precious few. You know, they say there's a billion Christians or so, a billion, 100 million Christians in the world. But what are those Christians? Are they born again people? Most of them are not. Most of them are in churches that teach that you have to work your way to heaven. They don't believe in the grace of God. All right? Um, so faith is a gift that God has to give. He gives it to you, and then you believe. Okay? You have to be regenerated. Now, regeneration, that's being born again. So first, you get born again, and then you believe in Christ. It seems to me all the Bible verses say, Whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Don't you have to believe first and then you get born again? Aren't there probably at least a couple of hundred verses in the New Testament that say that? Okay, it's all through the Bible. Faith and salvation. Not the other way around. But that's the way Augustine taught it and that's the way John Calvin taught it. Um, he also picked up the partnership of state and church and the persecution of dissenters from Augustine. Augustine was also locking people up and executing people back in his day. Um, here are some doctrines that the Roman Catholic Church got from Augustine. Okay, Calvin didn't pick up everything that Augustine believed, just some important things. But here's some other things that Augustine teaches. Um, the state church partnership, which Calvin also picked up. Infant baptism for regeneration, which Calvin also taught. Um, necessity of baptism for the forgiveness of sins. Purgatory. These things started with Augustine. Um, salvation in the Roman Catholic Church alone. The only way you can be saved is to be a faithful Roman Catholic. Apostolic succession from Peter. You know, they claim to go back to Peter, but nobody thought of that until 400 years later. Um, the sinlessness of Mary and the worship of Mary was started by Augustine. Uh, and putting the Apocrypha in the Bible. That was also Augustine's doing. Um, okay. There's a fellow named Philip Schaff. Uh, S-C-H-A-F-F, -F, who is regarded as one of the preeminent church historians. Okay? Uh, he's written books on church history and he's widely respected. He says this, Augustine is the principal theological creator of the Latin Catholic system. And when he says Latin Catholic, he doesn't mean the Latin Mass, okay, which they used to do. But he means the Latin Church, which had its headquarters in Rome. You've got the Latin Church, you've got the Greek Church, okay? And they separated from each other and fought each other. Um, but he is 
the creator, the theological creator of the Roman Catholic Church. Um, Benjamin Warfield, a Calvinist professor at Princeton Theological Seminary, uh, said this, it is Augustine who gave us the Reformation. Okay, now that's because Martin Luther and John Calvin followed Augustine. So he says Augustine is responsible for the Reformation. Uh, then he says this, Augustine was in a true sense the founder of Roman Catholicism and the creator of the Holy Roman Empire, which was the political end of things uh, during the Dark Ages. Um, there's, there's some, okay, he created the Roman Catholic Church, he created the Holy Roman Empire, the government of that day, in, in part of Europe anyhow, and he created or caused the Reformation. But these folks over here were trying to kill these folks over here. And it's all the same man who created both sides. I mean, this is, this is strange. And many, many, many Calvinists revere St. Augustine. They love Augustine. That seems funny. Okay, if you love a guy who's, you know, his followers killed your ancestors for centuries. That's, that's a little bizarre. Okay. Uh, at least it seems that way to me. Um, okay, so Calvin's theology was derived from his study of Augustine before he was saved. Augustine created Roman Catholicism. They, they, they have this confusion about their creators who, I don't know, living during the Reformation period would have been very, very difficult because all these different countries, France stays Catholic, Germany becomes Lutheran, Switzerland becomes Calvinist, Holland becomes Calvinist, Scandinavia becomes Lutheran, Italy stays Catholic, Spain stays Catholic, and guess what? The Catholics are raising armies and they're invading the Protestant countries, and some of the Protestant countries are raising armies and invading the Catholic countries, and if they happen to run across some poor Baptists, everybody's killing them. Okay, I mean, this is serious. They really did. Okay, we were the odd man out. Everybody hated us. And why? We didn't accept infant baptism. We said every individual has to believe in Jesus Christ for him or herself, and then as a believer submit to baptism by immersion, which doesn't save you. It's a picture of what Christ has done for you. Okay? And if you believed that, everybody else hated you. Augustine lived from 354 to 430. So he started off about the time of Constantine the Great when he, you know, saw the sign in the sky and in this sign conquer, and so he became a Christian. Died in, in 430. He spent most of his life in North Africa. He was born there, died there, spent some time in Italy. Uh, along the way, and um, was not a good guy at all. Um, James Arminius, he was Dutch. He grew up in the Dutch Reformed Church. Uh, he was born in 1560, died in 1609. Um, he was four years old when Calvin died. Um, he was raised as a Calvinist. He went to Calvin's school in Geneva. That's where he got his education. Uh, he was a thoroughgoing Calvinist. Along the way, somebody asked him, would you write a paper defending the key doctrines of Calvinism? And good Calvinist, a teacher, a pastor, he said, sure, I'll do that. So he studied it and studied it and studied it and decided, you know, there's a lot of this stuff I don't believe. And so he couldn't write the paper. Um, he did not believe that God was the author of sin. 
Okay? I don't believe that either. I think that's a heinous thing to say about God. That God is the author of sin. God makes you do the bad things you do. The bad thoughts you have. Okay? That's pretty extreme. But they say that. Um, he did not believe that saving grace was limited to a chosen few. I don't believe it either. Um, he did not believe that most of mankind had no hope or possibility of salvation. And I think anybody can be saved. When Jesus said to Nicodemus, whosoever, I think that's exactly what he meant. Okay? Um, he did believe. These are some things that Arminius did believe. Man's freedom of choice was decreed by God. So God decided man is going to have a free will. And I believe that's exactly what God did. Um, Christ's death was sufficient for all, but efficient only for believers. Okay, which is exactly right. Sufficient. His death was enough to save the whole world. He paid for all men's sins. But He only saves those who believe. Okay? So it's sufficient for everybody, but it only saves the believers. Okay? It, but anyone can believe. God's not saying, whoops, you can't believe, and you can't believe, and you can't believe, but you guys back there, yeah, I'll choose you. Um, you know, that's not what God did. God says it's for everybody. Um... Okay, uh, let's see. He said man can resist God's grace and that predestination, and this is really good, predestination is God's decree to justify and adopt believers and endow them to eternal life. Okay, and that's what predestination is. Predestination is God's guarantee that all believers are going to get to heaven. Okay? There is nothing in the Bible that says anybody was predestinate, predestinated to have faith. But all those who do have faith will someday be conformed to the image of His Son. That's what predestination is, and we'll show you that later. Um, okay. After these two men died, John Calvin and um, Arminius, they both died. And their followers began a controversy. First, the followers of Arminius said, this is what we think stinks about Calvinism. Okay, this is what we believe is wrong. They called the remonstrance, which is a protest. We protest. Um, Calvin's followers, within a few months, put together a paper of their own saying, this is what's wrong with, with Arminianism, and this is what we really believe. Um, and this went back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Um, it was supposedly ended. It never was ended. It's still going on. But this, this feud between these two sides was supposedly ended by the Synod of Dort in 1618. And they, the, the, the church leaders of Holland got together and made a final decree. Their judgment. This is what the church believes. And it's basically the Calvinist position. In fact, it's entirely the Calvinist position, which has been boiled down to those five points that spell out TULIP. Okay, and they said, this is what we believe. Anybody that didn't agree, if they were a pastor, they lost their church. Okay, and things like that. And there were a few of the Armenian leaders who were put in prison. Uh, not too many, but some. Um, this controversy continues. The Calvinists have pretty much stayed right in line with what was decided back 400 years ago. Okay, they, they're very strict in their acceptance of those things. Arminians have changed a great deal. I think James Arminius was probably a born-again man. Um, who believed in salvation by grace through faith, who believed in eternal security, 
but most of his followers today believe that works are absolutely necessary to get to heaven and that if you don't have good works you will lose your salvation. Okay? The Calvinists have decided that if you are not a Calvinist you are an Arminian by default. If you don't believe the five points of Calvin you have to be an Arminian in their way of thinking. Okay, well, beloved, we are not Calvinist or Arminian. Okay, um, there's a very definite distinction between what we believe and what either of these two sides believes. Why, why are we talking about this? Because Calvinism is overtaking Christianity in this country. Um, I come from Mississippi originally. Uh, grew up in Texas. All of my family, almost all, I've got a Mormon branch unfortunately, but most of the family, most of the family is Southern Baptist. Okay? Conservative Southern Baptists. Believers. And they fought for years, for decades, to try to get the liberals out of the Southern Baptist schools out of the Southern Baptist hierarchy at, at their convention headquarters, the Sunday School Board and the Missions Board and all that kind of stuff, trying to get the unbelieving liberals out of those positions so that the conservative Bible-believing people could run their convention. They don't call it a denomination, but anyway. And they finally did it. And you know what they've done now? They've turned over most of the seminaries to Calvinists. And the Southern Baptist seminaries, most of them are teaching strict Calvinism. That's going to produce a situation where you can forget about evangelism from the Southern Baptists. Okay? If you believe God predestined every single thing that happens before the world was even made, why should you talk to your neighbor about the Lord? Okay? God made that decision a long time ago and there's nothing you can do about it. There's nothing your neighbor can do about it. If he's not elected, he's going to hell. Period. Okay? So why be a witness? Anybody ever hear try to witness to somebody and all of a sudden your friend didn't like you? Well, why would you take that chance? It doesn't matter. Okay, what was decided before the foundation of the world is, is it. Total depravity. TULIP, okay? Total depravity means man is unable to save himself or contribute to his salvation. We believe that, don't we? Man cannot save himself. He can't even give anything to God to save himself. He cannot contribute to his salvation. But the Calvinists add something. That man is unable to understand anything from God and he is unable to respond to God in any way until God sovereignly regenerates him. God has to decide um, Howard is one of my elect. I choose Howard. And at some point in time I am going to give Howard the gift of faith, okay, which, which means the Holy Spirit is going to regenerate him, but because before he's regenerated, he cannot believe. So I'm going to regenerate him, and then I'm going to give him the gift of faith, and he's going to trust Christ. And lo and behold, he's going to think he did it himself. But that's not really true. Okay? God did it. Sovereignly. Okay? So that's total depravity which, like we said earlier, go through the Bible, faith, salvation, faith, regeneration, 
faith, reconciliation, all those words that describe the benefits of salvation, they all come after you believe, not before. Okay? Um, unconditional election. God, before the foundation of the world, chose to redeem certain people and to condemn the rest for no reason but that He wanted to. Okay, there's no conditions. It's not that, you know, God likes tall people and hates short people. It's not God, you know, it's, there's no reason at all except God went eeny, meeny, miny, mo. you're it. You know, you're elect, you're elect, you're elect. And it's, it's totally random, just according to what God decides. Uh, no reason for it. Um, well, Romans chapter 8, verse 29 says, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. The foreknowledge, God's foreknowledge comes before he made the decision who he was going to predestinate. Um, 1 Peter 1, verse 2 says, Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. So, foreknowledge comes first, and then predestination or election. So there is a condition according to the Bible. Okay, there's something that God foreknew, which we'll talk about later, um, but there is a condition. Um, and I think it's simply God foreknows who's going to believe it. Okay, and so He predestinated and elected them. Uh, there is no verse in the Bible that says anyone was elected or predestinated to believe. Okay, it's just not there. Uh, limited atonement. Uh, the definition, Christ died to pay for the sins of the elect and them alone. Okay. You've got to be careful who you witness to. This is what a Calvinist would say, and I've heard him say this. You can't tell a man Christ died for your sins because you don't know if He's one of the elect. Okay? And if He's not elect, Christ didn't die for His sins. Now, some of these things, I mean, if you didn't ever hear this before, it's like, you've got to be kidding. How could anybody say that? Okay, well, I don't know how they can say that, but they say it. Okay, I don't get it either. It's contrary to so much Bible. There's so many clear verses that say Jesus died for the whole world. Okay, but they disagree. Um, irresistible grace. If God has chosen you by His sovereign grace and offers the gift of faith, it is impossible to turn it down. You cannot refuse. Okay? If God chose you, you're it. You think, I mean, I can remember January 23rd, 1965, a fellow named Jim Williamson, a pastor, came over to our house and sat down with me and my older sister. He had talked to my parents a few days before and found out they were already saved, which was news to me. Um, but anyway, he sat down with me and my sister and led us to Christ. I can remember trusting Christ as my Savior. It was probably about 11 o'clock on a Saturday morning. Okay, we joined the church the next day. I thought I made a decision. But come to find out, I didn't. God did it before me, before the world began, and I didn't have a choice. Okay, God chose me. God offered me this grace to save my soul, and I didn't have the power to say no. And yet, Jesus said to Jerusalem, He says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that stonest the prophets and killest those that are sent unto thee, how often... I would have gathered thee together as a hen does her chicks, and ye would not. Ye would not. They had a choice. 
and they made the wrong choice. And unless they later changed their mind and put their faith in Christ, those people that he was talking to have been in hell all this time. All right, which is a terrible thought. Perseverance of the saints is the last one, and uh, we'll cover this quickly. The elect will persevere to the end of their life in faith and the works that faith produces. If you're chosen, you will not fall away. Okay, and you cannot fall away because God chose you. And God never makes a choice that's, you know, in error or a mistake or anything like that. Okay, it's got to be right. This is not the same as eternal security. John Piper, a very famous Calvinist, he says this, We must also own up to the fact that our final salvation... Okay, this doesn't make any sense, but I want you to listen. We must also own up to the fact that our final salvation, that we're going to get to heaven someday, we'll be with God someday, okay, is made contingent upon our subsequent obedience. Okay, in other words, if you don't work for it, you're not going to get there. Okay, you've got to obey in order to finally get to heaven. Okay? Made contingent. So your salvation depends on what you do tomorrow and the next day and five years from now and ten years from now. And if you blow it and die, you're going to hell. Now that's the same thing the Arminian says. But the Arminian says, you lost your salvation. The Calvinist says, well, he looked like a Christian all those years, but he really never was. Okay, he thought he was elected, but he wasn't one of the elect. Are works essential for salvation and assurance? According to the Calvinist, the answer is yes. According to the Bible, no. You're saved by grace. You're kept by grace. You will be in heaven someday because God gave you everlasting life. And it's never, ever, ever going to end. Mm -hmm.